Thank you. You may be seated. We're in Matthew this morning, continuing with the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, and I want to kind of connect with last week's story because this is really one story, one account, and the first part we need to understand to, to catch on what's happening here this morning. So last week we saw Jesus was headed to Jerusalem. And this young man, we're, t- we're told he was rich, he was young, he was a ruler, he had some uh, position in the community, whether it was in the synagogue or in the local government, we don't know. The word ruler there is a general term. So, but, but he's rich, he's, he's influential, he's moral. He comes to Jesus and falls at his feet and says, Master, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, keep the commandments. And he's like, which ones? And we're talking about, he's kind of like the kid that's like, what do I need to know for the test? I don't want anything extra. If I don't need it, I just want eternal life. I don't want to get stuck. If it's just a command for some reason, I don't need it. I just want to do enough to get eternal life. And so Jesus starts naming commandments. And he's like, I've done them, done them, done them. I'm good. What else? And Jesus looks at him, and the Bible says, and Jesus loved him. And Jesus said, okay, let's start at the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. And Jesus said, okay, I look at your heart, and you've got a problem. Money, your wealth, your possessions have become an idol in your life. You have not turned those over to God. You have not sought to glorify and obey God with your wealth. Sell what you have and follow me. And it says, he went away sorrowful because he had much possessions. And the disciples see this and Jesus said, it is very unlikely that a rich person is going to enter the kingdom of God. Now, we, we, we mentioned last week, and I want to bring us back to, don't skip over that warning. That warning should terrify Americans. Because we talked about last week that if you live in America, you are basically in the 2% richest people in the world. We look and say, you know, I, I'm not rich, or Bill Gates is rich, or, you know, that person... I know down the road, they're rich, I'm not rich. You're richer than 98% of the world. And so when Jesus warns against the dangers of riches, he is talking to you and me. And he is warning because it is so easy for wealth and money and possessions to gain a foothold in our life, to become the idol of our life to become the thing we trust in, the thing we look to for fulfillment and security and satisfaction. And Jesus warns. And then Peter steps in. And Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus, Peter said, Look, Lord, we, we left our jobs, we've left our homes, We left our 401ks. We've left it all to follow you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will sit on the twelve thrones, judging the tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sakes will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. Now, just a couple things I want us to notice here that are sometimes missed. Number one, not everything in the Bible is for you personally. Growing up, I used to sing a song. Some of you might have sung it. Every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. Are you familiar with that song? You know that song's a lie. (laughs) It is a bold-faced lie. Every promise in the Bible was not to me. See, notice even this passage. Peter says, Jesus, what will we get? And Jesus said, I say to you, you twelve, 
in the kingdom when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you, you twelve apostles, who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That is not a promise for everybody. Just think if it were, those twelve thrones would get really, really crowded. Right? I mean, do you think 12, you know, millions of people divided up on 12 thrones? And knowing my luck, I'd be on the bottom with some people with bad hygiene, right? <laughs> Every promise is not, you now I can learn from them. They're principles. They're things that I can learn from. But every promise is not to you or me. Some were to certain individuals. Some were to the nation of Israel. Some are to groups. Jesus says here, I say to you. Then he says, and everyone who has left these things. Now, when you see everyone, that includes you, right? But every promise doesn't. And so we need to understand that. Number two, don't ignore the reward. See, it's interesting. Peter comes and Peter's like, Jesus, what about us? We left everything to follow you. I have a, a, a stack of commentaries I look at every week before I come and preach, preparing and one of the things I found interesting that probably at least half of them comment, you know, here you go, Peter again, talking about why he shouldn't, right? I mean, here Jesus is preaching, teaching, Peter's like, what am I going to get, right? Why do I get for this? And they're like, Peter, this is selfish and stupid. I mean, think about it. If you were really, really spiritual, why would you serve God? Would you serve God for what you could get? Or what you could give? Would you serve God because of what's in it for you? Or for what you can offer Him? So I think most of us would quickly say that if we were spiritual and right with God, we would serve God to give, not to get. And we would probably say that, but we would be wrong. See, I can go to most Baptist churches today and say, it's not about your happiness. Follow God. Don't worry about being happy. And that sounds spiritual. But you know the one person who doesn't criticize Peter for his question is Jesus. And Jesus criticized Peter for a lot of his statements, right? Jesus was not above telling the disciples, y'all are stupid, you're foolish, why haven't you gotten it yet? But Jesus doesn't do that to Peter here. Peter says, Lord, what are we going to get? And you know what Jesus says? Jesus answers the question. Think about it. There's a, another song. You sing, um, I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. It would be blasphemous to sing, he needs me, oh, he needs me. Every hour God needs me. God doesn't need me. God doesn't need my assistance. God doesn't need my help. God is not up in heaven saying, man, I sure hope Whitney and Amy tithe today. If they don't, the kingdom of heaven's falling apart, right? I sure hope Whitney serves today. The kingdom of heaven did not turn when I surrendered into ministry. God is not up in heaven needing us. He calls us to serve Him. In fact, notice in Hebrews 11. By faith in it was taken up so he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. So God said of Enoch that he pleased God. Now it's interesting. He goes on. Without faith it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. You know what God says there? If you don't come to Him for the reward, you can't come. God says He is pleased when we come to God seeking a reward. In fact, you're going down in verse 24 of Hebrews 11. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And the rest of that passage says, Why? Because he had recompense to the reward. Do you know why Moses forsook Egypt? 
Because he considered the reward and decided God paid better than Egypt did. Don't ignore the reward. Number three, don't spiritualize everything. Some people want to spiritualize everything. They say, well, oh yeah, God, God spiritually blesses or God will bless us in heaven. You know what God says in this passage, Jesus says? He said, in this life, those who have put their trust in me, those who have given up and sacrificed for my sake, will receive a hundredfold. Don't spiritualize everything. But you know what? Also, don't ignore the spiritual. Some people want to spiritualize everything. Some people want to ignore the spiritual. I love the quote by Robert Morris. He said, being blessed means having supernatural power working for you. By contrast, being cursed means having supernatural power working against you. The days of the blessed per person are filled with divine coincidences and heavenly meaning. Throughout the Bible, Bible talks about God blessing and cursing. Throughout Deuteronomy, it says, I have set before you this day death and life, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. When you obey God, He blesses. Divine power works through you and for you. But you know what God says? When we reject Him, when we disobey Him, we receive a curse. Divine power works against us. So with these things in mind, Father, we come before you today. And I thank you, Lord, for your blessing. I thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to look in your word today. I pray that we would heed it. We would obey it. I pray, Lord, you'd be with me as I speak. Give me wisdom and clarity and power. Open our hearts and minds to you. Cleanse us from anything that might hinder your working, Lord, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. So the question becomes, what to expect? One thing I love about Jesus is there's no fine print. Jesus is very, very clear throughout his ministry about the cost and the benefits of following him. He's not like a smooth salesman who's trying to get you to sign something and there's some really, really fine print at the bottom. He doesn't do that. He is very upfront. He says, look, if you're going to follow me, and you're going to completely follow me, you're going to be willing to sacrifice home and family and land and wealth and everything this world says you need to live for, you need to know what to expect. And so what can you expect according to Jesus? Number one, you can expect persecution. In Mark 10, Mark gives his account of the story, and as we've talked about, Mark generally uh, gives a little more detail than Matthew. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, who will not receive a hundredfold in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. Now, that's interesting. Jesus says, look, I want you to understand something. If you get serious about serving me and following me, you better be ready for persecution. The word persecution is the idea, the, the Greek word there is the idea used for someone that's hunting down an animal to destroy it, to kill it. And he said, you need to understand, if you align with me, so when a person says, I'm going to give everything I have to God, I'm going to fully follow him, the enemy, Satan, the flesh, the world, are going to try to hunt down and destroy you. During the Revolutionary War, most people think of the Revolutionary War as being between America and Britain. It wasn't. It was between a group of Americans and a group of other Americans who sided with the British. You had about a third of the Americans at the beginning of the Revolutionary War who were patriots. You had about a third of Americans who were loyalists. They were loyal to Britain. So you had this huge civil war going on in the midst of the Revolutionary War. And you know what? There were a bunch of people. There was another third that was kind of undecided. They either wanted to be left alone or they would side with whoever happened to be winning at that moment. Whoever they thought would benefit them the most. There were quite a few people that actually fought on both sides during the war. 
And that's why the winter of 76, when things were looking so bad for the American cause, Thomas Paine wrote his Common Sense. And in it he said, these are the times that try men's soul. It's not the summer soldier who deserves praise. The summer soldier is the guy that shows up when the weather's good, when things aren't bad, when everything's going okay. He's like, no, no, those aren't the people that deserve praise. It's the people that stand no matter what. See, here's the reality. Satan is not concerned about most professing Christians in America because they've never really declared their allegiance. They serve God part of the time, and they serve Satan part of the time, and Satan's not too concerned about them. But when someone comes in and says, I am going to totally devote myself to the kingdom of God, to his cause, to his glory, my time, my energy, my possessions are all on the table. Now the kingdom of Satan takes notice. Because they've declared their allegiance. And Jesus says this person needs to understand persecution will come. But you know what? Persecution is also used by God. Someone put it this way, God must prepare us for what he's preparing for us. God must prepare us for what he's preparing for us. Think about Joseph in the Old Testament. His brothers bullied him, then he's sold into slavery, then he's sent wrongly to prison, all to prepare him to rule over Egypt. Or think about David. He spends a decade on Israel's most wanted list. He's first living in caves, then as an exile, all trying to escape the death from the hands of a mad, jealous king, all preparing him to be king. See, if God wants to bless us, one of the first things God has to do is to prepare us for the blessing. Some of the worst things God could do is bless us beyond what we're prepared to handle. And so God uses persecution. What Satan intends to destroy us with, God uses to perfect us and purify us. So don't be surprised if you're following God if hardship comes and trials come and persecutions come. Be surprised if they don't. See, I think some of us need to ask the question why we're not facing persecution. The Bible says all who follow Christ will suffer persecution. All. And y'all know the Greek word all, what it means? It means all. Right? So what does it mean if all who follow Christ will suffer persecution and I'm not suffering persecution John Wesley is an itinerant ministry throughout England was often mocked he had people throw things at him people try to run him off in some cases try to kill him and there was an occasion he had been almost I think it was almost a month with no persecution No challenges, no difficulties. And he stopped to consider that, and he stopped on his ride and got off his horse and prayed, God, what is wrong in my life that the enemy is not trying to stop me? See, I think most of us look at it and think, man, if things are smooth, that means everything's good. It may be the opposite. It may be the opposite. And Jesus says we need to expect persecution. But you know what else we can expect? We can expect provision. Notice Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and the first fruits of all your produce. Not some, all. What happens though? He said, then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting forth with wine. Proverbs 11 One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessings will be enriched, and the one who waters will himself be watered. He said, you know what? One gives away what they have, and they get richer. And there's another person who holds on to things they should give away because they think they're, they're better off holding 
what they should give. And you know what God says? They suffer want. The reality is that whoever brings blessing will be enriched. When I bless, when I use the wealth that God has given me to be a blessing, God says, I will be enriched. And the one who waters will himself be watered. Malachi 3 puts it perhaps most strongly anywhere in the Bible, will a man rob God? But you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? You are cursed with a curse. Divine power is working against you. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Notice this is the only place in the Bible I know where God says, test me. Try me out. Put, I invite you to put me to the test. Bring your tithes to the storehouse. We talked about last week. He says, tithe to the church. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. God says, you know what? Try me. Tithe. See, tithing is saying I'm better off with 90% in God's blessing than 100% without it. I'm better off with 90% in divine favor flowing through my life, divine power flowing through my life, than I am with 100% in divine power working against me. God promises to provide. He also promises to protect. Notice what the rest of that verse says, that passage. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil. And your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. The word devourer there was the word they used for worms and insects that would come, and they would eat the, the vine, and they would eat the roots of the plant, and they would eat the fruit before it was harvested. It, it, we see that today. It, someone said there's only one thing worse than biting into an apple and finding a worm. It's biting into an apple and finding half a worm. <laughs> see, you want that devourer rebuked. And here's what God says. I will protect your crops. I will protect your things. Now keep in mind, in that culture, most of their wealth depended on what they grew. They would grow the food to feed the animals, to feed the cows, to feed the oxen, to feed the horses. And they would grow the food for themselves. And they would grow the food to sell. And he said, look, you know what I'm going to do? If you put your trust in me and you give, I'm going to rebuke the devourer, the worms, the bugs. Not only are you going to save money on pesticide, but it's going to be much healthier and better for you. There's this interesting, look at and then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. He said, other people are going to see God's blessing for you. There's this interesting uh, passage in Deuteronomy. The children of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. And they come to the promised land, and they're on the edge of the promised land, and God is reminding them of what he's done, and he's preparing them to move forward. And Deuteronomy 8, verse 4, says something interesting that, that I never considered until I read this for 40 years in the wilderness, right? And do you know what there were not a lot of in the wilderness? There were not a lot of shopping stores, right? Amazon Prime did not deliver to the wilderness. And he says this, he said, You shall consider that for 40 years your feet did not swell and your shoes did not wear out. For 40 years, God allowed, God made their clothes and their stuff to hold up in that harsh, rough condition. He's like, you should consider. Did you ever wonder, at some point, our shoes should have worn out by now? They didn't. Why? Because God allowed it. There was no stopping and saying, oh, you know, Moses, we're right here by this TJ Maxx. Could I run in and see if they have a new shirt? I'm really... No! They got up every day for 40 years, and God protected. See, God's divine blessing and power not only provide, they protect. 
How does the devourer work? God allows our things to keep working, to keep going, to maintain, and God protects. There's a fourth blessing, and it's the blessing of partnership. The blessing of partnership. 1 Corinthians 3 says that we are God's co-workers. I love that. We are God's co-workers. See, a lot of people say, well, it's just all God. Right? Everything's God. You know what? That's not biblical. I love the story. There was a church, and they had some land next to the church, and no one took care of it. And there were weeds going everywhere and everything briars. It was just a horrible mess. It was an eyesore. So one of the men in the church came and said, you know, Pastor, I'd love to just kind of take that on as a ministry. It looks bad for the church. And could I just do something and make a kind of a little prayer garden, the pastor? If you want to do it, go for it. So the man spent months pulling weeds, tearing out thorns, tilling the soil, planting new plants. And after months and months of labor, people came by and noticed this beautiful garden. And, and, and some people come and say, man, isn't God's garden beautiful? And the man said, yeah, but you should have, had it when God, you should have seen it when God had it all to himself. You say, Pastor, that's blasphemous. No, it's biblical. Everything God does, He uses us to do. We are called to be co-laborers with God. He goes on in 1 Corinthians. Notice it says, "If any Paul says, If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, the fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work has been built, survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will be lost, but he will be saved, yet it will be like one who escapes through fire. He said, we're called to build. We're called to work for God's ministry. And he said, what does that look like, co-laboring for God? I kind of picture it like when my kids were little. We lived in the Carolinas, and in the Carolinas they have green stuff on the ground called grass. And grass grows, and, and, and you have to cut it, which is okay, because there are few smells better than fresh cut grass. The other nice thing about cutting grass is most people leave you alone. And as an introvert, you get to go cut grass, and they leave you alone. It's great. Nobody comes and bothers you. They're afraid you might ask them to help. But you know what? You'd be out there cutting the grass, pushing the lawnmower, and sometimes I'd have a little three-year-old girl come up, or four-year-old girl, and say, Daddy, I want to help you cut the grass. So you know what you do if your dad and your three or four-year-old says you don't help cut the grass? You say, okay. And there's this little bar in the middle of the lawnmower, and she goes and she grabs on. Now, she can't push that lawnmower very far at all or straight. So you know what that means you got to do? you got to get behind it, but now you have to back up so you don't run over her. And you can't walk normally. you got to spread out. And so you got to push, and it, what would have taken you an hour and a half now takes you an hour just to go one row. And you know what? She stays out until she's tired. Then you know what she does? She goes in the house and says, Mama, I've been helping Daddy cut the grass. Did she tell the truth? Yes and no. But you know what? It's okay. Because she gets to go with pride and honestly say, I was out helping Daddy cut grass. And you know what God invites us to do? Not because he needs us, not because he's limited by us, not because he's up in heaven saying, man, I sure hope Whitney and Amy tithe today. I don't know what the kingdom of heaven's going to do. Not because he says, man, I hope so-and-so teaches, because if they don't, I don't know what's going to happen, because he wants to give us the privilege of being able to say, I'm a co-laborer with God. He wants us to be able to look at what he's done and said, we were a part of that. He gives us the privilege and the honor of working with him. You know, we're, we're in a building today. These buildings have been here for about 20 years. And you know why? They're, they're here because other people sacrificed and gave to build them. And you know what? Those people for all of eternity in heaven are going to be able to rightfully look at every person that came to Christ on these grounds. Every seed that was planted in someone's life. Every act of love and kindness that was displayed here. And they're able to say, we were part of that. Even people that have been touched years after they've gone on, they can say, we were co-laborers with God in building that. This week at a one, uh, VBS, 
We're going to have about 100 workers that are going to be able to go and say, man, we are co-laboring with God. We get to be his partners. But you know what? There's another reward, and the reward is paradise. This world is not the end of the story. In fact, all of God's accounts will not be settled here. That passage in 1 Corinthians we just read talks about that. Our works will be measured on that day. <clears throat> Eternity is real. We hear people say life is short, enjoy it. Someone said what we should say is eternity is long, prepare for it. Eternity is long, prepare for it. Are we prepared? See, how I use my wealth on earth will determine much about my eternity. First, it reflects whether or not I'm really following Jesus. As Jesus made clear last week, if you're following Jesus with everything but your money, you're not following Jesus. If you're following Jesus with everything but your family, you're not following Jesus. Second, it shows whether I'm ready to be trusted with greater things in eternity. Jesus said he was faithful and least is faithful also much. He said if you can't be trusted with worldly riches, who's going to entrust you with true wealth? True wealth. He tells a parable we're going to see in a few months about a master who leaves. Master picture of God. And he, he, he leaves one person with five talents. A talent was a large sum of money in those days. One, two, and one, one. And the ones that use their wealth, their talents well, when the master comes, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. I am going to put you over five cities. I'm going to put you two cities. Do you do realize people will be ruling in heaven? People are going to be in positions of power and authority in heaven. Do you know who is going to be? The ones who were faithful here on earth. And third, only in eternity will all the accounts of our life be settled. Matthew and Mark both closed the story with this warning. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You mean the WWVS, the Whitney Walters version? It puts it like this. There are many people who look like they're winning the race of life who are going to get to eternity and find out they lost. And there are other people who the world looks at and thinks they're, win they're losing and get to heaven and find out they won. See, by all earthly standards, the rich young ruler is winning. But you know what? On the day of judgment, when he gets to the finish line, he's going to find out he lost. So let me ask you a question today. How much of your life does not make sense to those who don't follow Jesus? If everything in your life makes sense to those who don't follow Jesus, something's wrong. How I spend my time should be looked at by unbelievers as being ridiculous. How I spend my money should be looked at as unbelievers as ridiculous. How we do things as a family should be looked at unbelievers as ridiculous. My values and my service to a different master than they serve should be reflected by them looking at my life and say, you know what, that guy's a little messed up. He's a little off. His values are weird. If nobody thinks you're weird, if everybody thinks you're weird, you probably are, right? <laughs> if nobody thinks you're weird, something's probably wrong with that. Heard about some missionaries that had spent their life in Africa. Forty-some years they had been there. and In the early 1900s, they were coming home. Their health, their age had made it just impossible for them to continue to minister there. And so they got on a boat and they were traveling home. And on that boat was a famous entertainer of that day who was known for his very worldly life. He did everything for pleasure and profit. And as they approached the harbor, the harbor was packed with people to welcome that entertainer home. 
And the missionary looked at his wife. The man said, you know, honey, it's not fair. It's not right. We've spent our lives serving God. We have very little money to show for it. And we've been gone for 40 years. And we come home. And there's not one person here to welcome us. And here this entertainer is. And he's spent his life pursuing wealth and pleasure and, and his life and nothing for God. And he comes home after a couple weeks vacation and the, the harbor won't even support all the people there to welcome him. This is not right. He and his wife came home and they, or came back and they, they got a little hotel room there that night. And the wife could look at her husband and tell that he was upset. And she said, you know, this is really bothering you. You need to go talk to God about this. So he did. He went in the little bedroom there and a while later, he came back and she said, did you tell God how frustrated you were about coming home and no one greeting you and everyone being there to welcome this man? And the missionary said, I did. And she said, what did God tell you? He said, God reminded me we're not home yet. God reminded me we're not home yet. See, why should we expect a homecoming before we get home? See, for people who live for this world, this is as much a homecoming as they're going to get. But Jesus said to Peter, he said, they will receive in this life and the life to come. There's one final expectation. Expect pleasure. Expect pleasure. And that, 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 that doesn't fit with many people's expectations. They see Satan is offering happiness and joy, and God is not. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Satan offers a pick. See, sin's appeal is it's a pick. It's pleasurable, it's immediate, it's certain. See, Satan offers his best now. Why do people smoke cigarettes? They're pleasurable, they're immediate, they're certain. You go, you light the cigarette, you know what you're going to get, you know the pleasure's coming and you're going to get it immediately. Now, years later, you have lung cancer and die. But right now, it's good. Satan offers his best now. God doesn't offer a pick. But Jesus does say, I'm come that you might have life and you might have it abundantly. We see this expounded on in Ecclesiastes. In Ecclesiastes, the gist of the book, if you're not familiar with it, King Solomon wrote, he was one of the wealthiest people who ever lived. And he had time and energy and money to do whatever he wanted. And so he spends his life trying to find what brings the most enjoyment of life. And he goes from being an alcoholic to a workaholic. He becomes a womanizer. He builds. He does all these things. And finally he writes his conclusion. Ecclesiastes 2. There is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat and who can have enjoyment? You see what Solomon realized? Enjoyment comes from God. He goes on. For to the one who pleases him... God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. We think of God as giving wisdom and knowledge, but God also is the one who gives joy. Ecclesiastes 5. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. People thought, I'm going to keep my wealth and I'm going to be better for it. And he said, no, that didn't happen. Why? Because of verse 19. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and the power to enjoy them. This is the gift of God. He says there's some people God's given wealth and possessions, but he has withheld the power to enjoy them. There is an evil, chapter 6, that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them. Do you see what Solomon has realized? 
He goes on, if a man fathers a hundred children, lives many years, so that the days of his life are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good thing. He also has no burial. I say his stillborn child is better off than he. Do you see over and over, Solomon keeps telling us, it doesn't matter how much you accumulate if God does not give you the ability to enjoy it. A little math lesson as we're kind of wrapping things up here. How many of you like to learn some math? Some of you look like you need to refresh your course, right? <laughs> Multiplicand times multiplier equals the product, right? So if I take three and I multiply it by one, what do I end up with? Good. Good. All right. Now, if I want to make my product bigger, I can increase my multiplicand. Four times one equals what? Four. Good. <clears throat> or I can increase the multiplier. Three times two equals what? Six. Now, notice, by increasing the multiplier by one, the number gets a lot bigger than increasing the multiplicand by one. There's one other rule of multiplication. Any number times zero equals what? Zero. All right? So that's our mathematics. Let me erase my board here, and then we'll look at one other application of this. On one hand, you have God-given gifts. Friends, family, possessions, wealth, strength. You also have God-given satisfaction. Those two together determine how much joy and peace you have. So say someone has a three in the God-given gifts and a one in God-given satisfaction, their joy and peace is a three. And you know what most of us think? Our world tells us, well, the way to become happier, to have more joy and peace, is to increase your gifts. So we work hard, but you know what? If I increase my gifts a little, but God does not give me any more satisfaction, my joy and peace only go up a little. And you know what? There are some people that seek to enjoy their gifts in such a way that actually takes away their God-given satisfaction. And they have more and more than they've ever had, but you know what? They have less and less satisfaction than they've ever had. But you know what? There are some people, they're, what their gifts have, in fact, you know what? Some of them might even live in such a way that some people live in such a way that their gifts actually decrease. But you know what happens? God increases the satisfaction. And you know what the result is? They're far more joy and peace than they ever had. And see, it's the equation of enjoyment. It's what Jim Berg calls it. And it's when we realize that God not only gives gifts, but satisfaction and joy and peace come from Him. So what all this really comes down to is a matter of faith. Who are you going to trust? See, missing things, even a little bit, mess up a lot. If you're making a recipe and you leave out one ingredient, what can happen to the recipe? It can be a disaster. If you're putting a puzzle together and you miss one piece, it will never be complete. You try to put some bookshelves together and you miss a screw, the whole thing's not stable. And if you keep one part of your life from God, for many people it's the money, you will never have a life that God blesses. See, ultimately it comes down to a matter of trust, faith. Will I trust God or money for my provision, my protection, and my reward? Close with the story of Philip of Arcania and Alexander the Great. Philip was Alexander's personal physician. 
he had also been a longtime friend of Philip's. And a number of ancient sources tell the story that as Alexander was preparing for his conflict with Darius, the, the winner of that conflict would have basically limitless access to the control of the world. Alexander got sick. And Philip, his friend, was bringing him medicine and giving him treatment for this. And one night Alexander lay in bed and Philip had just handed him a bowl, a cup with medicine for him to drink. When a courier came in with an urgent message from one of Alexander's generals that said Alexander had to read it immediately. And so as Alexander's holding this bowl, this cup of medicine, he reads the letter. The letter says that Darius has been paying Philip, the king's physician, to poison Alexander. And that what Alexander holds in his hand is not really good for him, but it will slowly destroy him. So here Alexander sits, cup of something from his physician, and a warning saying that he's poison. You know what Alexander did? He gave the letter to Philip and drank the medicine. He recovered and went on to conquer the world. One historian said this, the secret to Alexander's success. He knew who he could trust. In reality, all of us are Alexander. We're laying in bed with sickness and pain and suffering of this life. And we have a God who created us, who died to redeem us, and he's offering us what he says is life. He says, take this. And you will find joy and fulfillment and life. But as we're about to take it from him, another messenger comes and says, oh, don't listen to Jesus. He's coming to steal and to kill and destroy. He's coming to take from you all the things that are necessary for your happiness. Reject him. Follow me. And you and I must choose who we will trust. Will I trust God? Will I trust him with my life, with my plans, with my dreams, with my finances, with my family? Or will I reject him and follow the enemy? As Dick comes to lead us, in a song of invitation, I just want to ask you a question. Who are you going to trust? And I don't know what God may be saying in your heart today, but maybe you're here today. And there's some part of your life that you've tried to withhold from God. And God says, man, it's time for you to put that last piece in there. If that's to you, I want to encourage you surrender to him today. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, your Lord and Savior, we'd love to share with you how you can know Him. We're here today. If there's some needs you're going through, some burdens, we'd love to walk with you through that. Pastor Andy and I will be in the back. We'd love to pray with you, talk with you. Pastor Wayne will be there with us. If we could help you in any way. Father, we come before you today. We thank you for your blessing. We know the enemy comes with his lies, Lord, but I pray you would help us today that we would trust you. We would put everything in your hands. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand your feet.